Okay, so actually, the title of this sermon is called Lukewarm. <laughs> and that's actually a picture of, they call her Miss Clara. And she's an elderly woman who's kind of feisty. And she's a, a prayer warrior. She reminds me of Marjorie Hunter, who's sick right now. And um, she's pictured here praying with this woman who actually was trying to be, she's a real estate agent, trying to sell her house. And she wasn't even concerned about selling the house. She was concerned about her. And so we look at lukewarm. Many times in our lives, we get lukewarm. And there are a lot of people that come to church and they're lukewarm. They're not for or against, they just kind of come, they do their time, they put in their money, and they go away, and they live life like they never even bothered. And see, I don't know about you, but if I gave my marriage that kind of attention, and it was just kind of lukewarm, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to kind of go, kind of move this way and that way, just kind of stay, and it's no big deal, right? Same thing if you're working and you do your job, day in and day out, it's just like, okay, another day of the job, right? There's no before or against, I'm really going to work hard today, or, you know, I, I, I want to quit. So it's just kind of like you're just kind of riding it out, right? I'm here to tell you that I pray that today is going to start a new ignition in this church. I pray that today, and it starts with me, that our hearts will ignite to once again just cry out to Him. So, we're going to start with Scripture. If you have your Bibles or you have your phones, um, you can turn to the very back of the book called, uh, the, the, called Revelation. And this is Revelation chapter 3 we're going to be looking at. Now to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, John is having a, a heavenly encounter with God. He's not dead. He's receiving a revelation, a, a vision. And it depends on how you study the book. Some people think it already happened. Some people are like, you know, this was the vision about the churches to come. Um, it's kind of like a type. But he, sp he speaks of a certain area called Laodicea. And when we go through this, I want you to think about this. If God says this about us, we got a real problem. And what he's speaking of is he's speaking of the church of Laodicea. And he says this in verse uh, 14. Okay. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And he's speaking, God's speaking to the church. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you, become, you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put in your eyes, so you can see. Those who I love, I rebuke him in discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Ouch. Essentially, what he's saying to the church is, yeah, I know, you're a mega church. You're in a really, really good spot. You've been, quote, unquote, blessed. You've had all these things happen, and you don't need me. Guess again. It's very simple that once things start happening where the chairs start getting filled in, the offering goes through the roof, that, 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 you know, all of a sudden everything starts happening, the kids' ministries hopping and everything else, we go, oh, great. And then we forget. And the same thing happens in our own lives, doesn't it? We cry out to God and we ask Him for this and that and that, and it finally happens, and then we go, 
That's over. All right, back to my life. And that's what happens in, in our lives, and it's like a cycle. But he's saying, aren't you hungry for me? When he talks about being refined like fire, that's a verse that Peter used in his letter, talking about faith. In other words, he's saying, stretch yourself even further. Don't be complacent on what you're, you're, you just got this right now and this is it. Continue to stretch yourself and go further. Trust me with bigger and bolder things. Step out and trust me. So, I believe the video is coming up next. I'm going to, um, I'm going to play a video that's actually from the movie. And the scenario is, um, Miss Clara is sitting with, I can't remember her name, but she's the, the real estate agent, and they're, they're getting ready to have coffee. Now they're talking about their life. She's asking her about her life. And I want you to catch what happens here at the very end. Well, let me go to the next one. The first thing is we need to be honest with ourselves. Serious is truth. Notice where it's written. We cover our eyes to it. It's right there. Before I show the video, let me address this. This is hard. I had this happen to me this week where I had to like literally sit down with myself and say, okay, where am I hiding? Am I totally sold out for God? Or am I more busy with making sure everything's right in the church? Have I, have I spent quality time with him? Have I truly reached into my soul and really worshiped him? And today I actually felt like worshiping him. It was great. I felt like, oh my goodness, like I, the songs were just hitting me one after another. I was like, yes. Sometimes I just have such a dry spell. Have you ever been there? You just feel like there's no God anywhere. You put the music on, you're like, okay, be happy, happy, happy. And you're like, I ain't being happy, happy, happy. I don't feel like worshiping God right now. I need to do the dishes. I need to go work. I need to do this, I need to do that. But we're taking our eye off of Him. Do we just cry out to Him and just say, Lord, you are my everything? But here's the hard part. When we're not truthful about ourselves and we hide things, we can't hide from Him. We cannot hide from Him what we do. We can't hide from him our heart. He knows it. It's not like, okay, I'm ready now to talk Lord. He's already got it. He's got the x-ray vision in the web in the little webcam right in our heart. So video must be a couple slides later. Let's take a quiz. You guys can write this down in your bulletin for yourself if you'd like. Okay? On a scale from zero to ten. And we'll just say it probably should be zero being the worst, ten being the best. Please answer the following and write them down in your bulletin. This is for this is for you. I've already done mine. It says, in your opinion, how close are you right now to God? Zero being the coldest and ten being on fire. Yeah, write it down. Right now, honestly, how close are you to God? Zero to be you're so far away, you have, you're not even in the same galaxy. Tend to be like, I feel like he's right here. Okay. Second one is this, regarding closeness to God, where do you want to be one year from now? Why are these questions being asked? Because it's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge all of us to not just say it, but we're actually going to hold each other accountable. Because it's one thing to come to church and just say, okay, good message, or yeah, it was good, and the songs were good, and Steve talked, and let me get back on my way. But are we challenging ourselves in, in different things in our life? Are we, are we visioning things of what we, where we want to be and what we want to see? And there's a scripture that says, my people perish because of lack of vision. I hear so many people come to me and say, well, I really would love to do that, but I'll never do that. I really want to do this, but it's just not going to happen. I'm going to start my photography business, but you know, I've had so many bad things happen to me, I just can't do it. I'm going to start church and ask you, it's impossible. You know, you have so much to go. You have no, you have no money, come on, really. <laughs> okay? And if you talk to and research business leaders who have been pioneers, and ask them, or go research what they thought when they started their companies and what people told them, Milton Hershey failed, I think it was about almost three times, he started the sugar cane business. And the third time, People laughed at him, like, you're going to start chocolate, really? 
Well, guess what? He built a whole town on it. He put a lot of people to work in the, in the war. During the war. And of course, the Hershey kids. How can we forget that? So, are you currently moving at a pace to meet your goal one year from now? Do you have any kind of idea what that looks like? And again, I'm going to give you some pointers with that, but the first thing to start is repenting, believing, baptism, and yes, the lights have been flickering. He's here. Oh, we're moving some stuff today. I can... Nope. 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 So, no balloon either. Here's usually balloon here. Um, this is, these are the things that we need to be honest about and really take an honest assessment in our life. Where are we going? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Where am I going in life? Am I progressing or am I regressing? Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Now, what did you say your husband did for a living? Um, well, we actually haven't talked about that, but he's a sales rep for Brightwell Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And uh, when did you say you attended church? Well, we occasionally attend Riverdale Community. Mm -hmm. So you would say you know the Lord? Yes, I would say I know the Lord. You think the Lord is okay with this asking for us? Mm -hmm. And you have children? Miss Clara, my husband Tony and I have been married for 16 years. We have one daughter, her name is Danielle, and she's 10. She enjoys pop music and ice cream and jumping rope. Oh, well, that, that's good to know. Now, you say you attend church occasionally. Is that because your pastor only preaches occasionally? Miss Clara, I really would like to help you sell your house. That's why I'm here. As far as my faith is concerned, I believe in God, just like most people. He's very important to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me get my coffee. So if I asked you what your prayer life was like, would you say that it was hot? Oh. I don't know that I would say it's hot. I mean, we're like most people. We have full schedules. We work. But I, I would consider myself a spiritual person. I'm not hot, but I'm not cold either. Just, you know, somewhere in the middle. Here you go. I've got cream with sugar if you need it. Oh, no, thank you. I like it black. Miss Clara, you like your coffee room temperature? No, baby, man. <laughs> it's lukewarm. Ask yourself these honest questions here. How diligently do you seek and pursue a closer walk with God each day? Do you really make it a priority or is it just kind of a secondary thing? How much time and effort do you spend in His Word and in prayer each week? I mean, if you really want to know where a starting point is, if you are saying to yourself right now, okay, I know I'm circling a zero or a one on that scale that we just talked about, you're going to write these down because this is going to help you get to where you need to be. How much time and effort do you spend in His Word and prayer each week? That is a huge one right there. Without feeding your spirit, you're starving. Do you make an effort to remember and apply the, the Word of God after you hear it, or do you usually walk away forgetting it? Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes, when I read in the morning, I kind of it gets fuzzy, and if something doesn't stick out at me, I kind of did my, my chore. But there are moments where something sticks out of it, and I, um, God keeps highlighting it. I'm like, whoa, yeah. And I, I kind of take that along with me. Um, how quickly do you obey God when He's telling you to do something? That's huge. 
When you hear that voice, and you know he's asking you to do something that you don't want to do, and you know it's the right thing to do, and you don't want to do it, how fast do you turn and listen and obey, or do you fight him on it? When God reveals sin in your life, how quickly do you confess and repent of it? That's a huge one, too. If you just agree and just say, well, I didn't do it. Oh, yeah, well, I did do it. But I'm okay. And he's asking you to fess up. And trust me, guys, I have to answer all these questions, too. And the point is, is that it's not to shame people. God isn't doing this to shame us. He wants us to grow, and he wants us to be honest and real with him. And he will take us where we are and mold us and do an amazing miracle in all of us. You guys ready for a miracle? Yes. Two or three people over there. You guys ready for a miracle? Yes. What, what? Do I have to throw something at somebody? You guys ready for a miracle? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Check the pulse here. All right. You know? Be because how are we going to get a miracle if we're not expecting one? How are we going to get a miracle if we're not even understanding that God is the miracle maker? How are we going to get a miracle if we're not even willing to repent? Which means turn from your ways. That doesn't mean become perfect all of a sudden. It just means that we have to be honest and say, Lord, that's a messed up spot I got. Help me. That's all we're going to do. And he will work us through it. But if we just ignore it and just say, well, you know, that's under control, or I'm not dealing with that today, guess what? He knows. He always knows. As Clara says, there's a couple of her quotes, you say you attend church occasionally. Is that because your pastor only preached occasionally? I love that one. So if I asked you what your prayer life was like, would you say that it was hot or cold? You don't have to step on the same landmines that I did. That's a waste of time. I don't want to give away too much of the movie, but the bottom line is the woman that, that Miss Clara was talking to, they show her family life and what she said there about, I've been married 16 years and all that. The hell that was going on in her household, you saw that in another scene. And he was a traveling salesman. And their household was a mess. Beautiful home. Oh, beautiful home. Great job. Marriage was a mess. But she made it look good, didn't she? And all we did as Christians, Oh, we make it look so good. Oh, we put the mask on. It looks great. I'm happy. Happy, happy, happy. Stretch your little cheeks. Everything's great. Bless God. Bless you. Bless everybody. Throw tissues all over the place and say, bless, bless, bless. But if you really look inside of them, they're a mess. But they won't take the time to actually address it and say, i got to get straight here. Now, that doesn't mean perfect. That means I'm, I'm back in line with God's will for my life. I don't want everybody to think that you've got to straighten up or you can't come to church or straighten up or you can't be with God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about acknowledging the fact that we're all messed up. You're messed up. I'm messed up. And that we need God to help us through it. And there are people that will go all the way through this life and will never admit that. All the way to their grave in pride. Some reasons why people wanted Jesus in the Bible. They were curious. There were the curious who considered Jesus a novelty. There were the skeptics who considered Jesus a fraud. There were the starstruck who considered Jesus a celebrity. There were the faithful who considered Jesus a teacher, a friend, and a leader. And then there were those who were plain out desperate. Let's take a look at it. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43, tells two stories about people who are really, really, truly desperate. One describes a, a powerful leader seeking healing for his daughter, and the other describes a poor woman seeking healing for herself. I want you to see this. I, I, I really never even gave this a thought. Two people from both, like, complete opposite ends of life, but they both want the same result. They want healing. One of them wants it for his daughter, the other one wants it for herself. And what I find amazing is Jairus, or Jairus, I don't know, depends on how you pronounce it, his background was he was a very powerful dude. He was kind of like, 
over like they had these little synagogues, it would be like little churches. And he was like over like you know a group of them, which was a really powerful guy. He ruled with much influence. And the thought was that maybe he came to Jesus as a last ditch effort to save his daughter. Because you gotta figure, he's high up in the church, so you know, hey, he's got privileges, right? Nothing happened. And it says that, that he he kicked propriety, which you know, meaning that the elevation to the curve falls on his knees at the feet of Jesus and shamelessly begs repeatedly. See, you could be a big prominent business leader, you still need Jesus. You could be the Donald Trump of the world. You could be the Bill Gates of the world. You still need Jesus. Now, whether you acknowledge that or not is a different story. But then you come to the other side of the spectrum where you have the woman with the bleeding issue for over 12 years. She has what's believed to be a menstrual bleeding issue. She's poor. She's considered ritually unclean, which means if you were considered unclean, nobody was to touch you, and you were to be put out of the camp. You were, you were ostracized. You were singled out and said, you cannot touch anyone. That was part of the old Levitical rule. She was broke after spending every dime on doctors. Medicare, Aetna, and everything else didn't work. Obamacare, you name it, didn't work. She went through all the doctors. She's seen everybody, nothing. She has no advocate. She has to fight her way to Jesus. She literally fights her way through a crowd. By herself. Weaving through the crowd, the woman sneaks up on Jesus from behind, and extending her hand, she touches his cloak, and immediately she's healed. Can you imagine that, guys? Let's put that in perspective for a second. Let's just say in this room, we've got 500 people, and we only have a capacity of 250. And Jesus is in the middle of the room, and he's shaking hands and kissing babies. And tell everybody a book Republican. No, I'm just kidding. God, you guys are women today. The jokes are free, Jason. Come on, man. You know, I mean, you know, he's, he's in the middle, and, and you know, he's got all these people around him. And there's a woman all the way back here, all the way back here, and she's poor. She's got no representation. She is literally desperate, and she's got to go from there to there. And women in that day were really treated like third class citizens, if not worse. Jesus didn't treat them that way, though. And she moved her way all the way through and grabbed the hem of his garment just to touch it, just to think, maybe, just maybe, if I just get my fingertip on it, I can be healed. Jairus had all the power. He could have threw a bag of money down at Jesus and said, look, make it happen, G. But they both, see, somebody finally got it. I'll be your waiter all, all weekend, you know. Just, all right, so, so I'm, I'm just saying though that both had, both were desperate for Jesus. They one might have had maybe the wrong intention, but he was still desperate because he wanted his daughter to live, and all the money in the world couldn't get the healing. He probably went to the University of Penn and all these different hospitals that we talk about in Jefferson, and he couldn't get the healing. His daughter was still going to die. He was desperate for something, anything. Have you ever been there? You utilize everything you possibly can, and there's nothing left that you can do. And of course, what do we say? All we can do is pray, which is flip opposite of what the Bible tells us. We should seek Him first before we exhaust all of our options. That's what it says. And this poor woman, she don't have the money. She don't have the power. Welfare is dried up. Everything's going, and she's going to fight her way over there. Jairus can probably just go over there and say, look, I need to talk to you. And they'd be like, okay, back it up. Jairus is here. Her? Who are you? Why are you pushing? Get out of the way. And she made her way up there desperate. How desperate are you to have that kind of relationship with God? How desperate am I? To reach out and touch the hem of his garment and ask for healing. How desperate are we in our heart that we desperately seek him? And that is a question that I don't believe is being asked very often. And a lot of times we say that it has to be because of tragedy or something that happens in our life that suddenly gets our attention. 
Why does it have to be that way? God's saying, are you desperate for me all the time? Are you constantly seeking me? Are you, are you just yearning to have a relationship with me? Because I, my burning desire is for that. But no, everything else distracts you and everything else gets in the way. And then when the crap hits the fan, then you come crying to me. That's not the position that he wants. And I'm telling you guys, when I looked at both these situations, I'm thinking, money, no money, didn't matter. They both cried out to him. So it doesn't matter if you're on the upper scale, lower scale, you know, economically, socially, or whatever. God says, I want all of you to come with me. Because I'm the source of everything. And I believe wholeheartedly that as a church and as church is, I believe that we've lost our passion. We really have. We love the club. But, you know, it's our club. And we do things the way our club is. Well, how desperate are we to reach out to other people? How desperate are we to reach out to God himself and just say, Lord, do a miracle in me? I, I, I don't want to be this way. And some of you, maybe your life isn't that bad. And you're like, well, I've been blessed, and I've, I've helped out, and I've done this and that. And I'm not, I'm not saying shame anyone. But are you desperate to say, Lord, I want to know you more? See the difference? You know, if I want to know my mom more, I need to spend time with her. If I want to know my wife more, or my kids, I need to spend time with them. You guys with me? If you don't do that, I sat with Pastor Rob Weinstein, who we had dinner at the... Uh, at Texas Roadhouse the other night, we were talking about Code Blue and stuff. And we were just talking about stuff, and he said, you know, he says, if you stop inquiring of your wife, like if you stop investing in her, you're going to stop loving her. It convicted me. And you know, Mr. Romantic, I go from there to Walmart, okay? One person's going to be there. I know, thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. I go to Walmart, and I'm like, you know what? I want to buy these lamps for her, because these Tiffany lamps are driving me nuts. They're like 15 years old. They're like all hanging and everything. And she loves Tiffany, but I can't find Tiffany. I find these, you know, nice little brown, shady things that look more contemporary looking. I'm like, yeah, that's it. And I'm going to get her car, and I'm going to tell her how she lights up my life, and I'm going to kind of like play it together, you know, smoothie smooth, right? Horrible decision. Anyway, so, um, so I get home. Yeah, I come home with this bag, and she's like, so how was it? You know, and I was like, good. I said, I need to see you in the other room. And she's like, you know? I said, no, come on. And I got the bag on the bed. Of course, it's not wrapped. It's got a big Walmart bag on there and everything. No Billy, yo. So, so I, got the, I got the bag right there, right? And, you know, she's like, and she didn't even look at it. I'm like, wait a minute. You know what that told me? She's not even expecting anything from me. When was the last time I did that? And I use money as an excuse. We don't have it, honey. We don't have it, honey. We don't have it, honey. Really? You mean to tell me in my dumb mind that I can't come up with another idea that doesn't cost anything? Because I stopped investing in her. Oh, we'll come to church and we'll tell you we love each other. Oh, we're a happy couple. I hear some people say it all the time. Oh, he puts pictures over on Facebook. He loves his wife. But I just revealed something to you. God just revealed something to me. She wasn't even expecting him because it's already been gone. It's not about the material thing. It's about the, the thinking, the thought, was I seeking her? And when she saw it, my wife's very particular. Very particular. So as soon as she sees it, she's like, I love my Tiffany's. And I'm like, you haven't dusted it in ages. Look at it, you know? So I'm trying to sell her on it. I'm like, take, you know, and then I'm, then I'm doing the old, well, you know, if you don't like them, I got the receipt, we can just take them back. You know, deject it. All right, so I go in the other room, and I'm like, you know, you can, you can bring it back. I'm not mad. No, really, I'm not mad. Okay? And, you know, and, and the whole night's going down fast, right? You know, I had a great meal, a great thing, trying to bring it home, going south. So, I started to take it out. The thing is impossible to put together. I don't know how they did it in China. I don't know how they put this thing together. And the, the, the lampshade is, like, weird. And so I'm trying to bend this thing, and I'm here and going, this doesn't work. And I'm like, well, take it back. I'm like a recorder at that point. Take it back. Take it back. Take it back. Right? So 
I'm trying to bend this thing, so finally I call out the big gun. It's like, I said, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going down alone, okay? So, you know, great father I am. I bring my son in to take the hit. So I'm like, hey, man, can you help bend these? So he gets two out of three. I give him a lot of credit. I walked in the other room. I'm like, well, we got two. So I'm trying to third. Push my thumb in. My thumb's turning green. You know, and I'm going like this and this and this. And I'm thinking, hmm. And, and now all the parts have been removed. All the stuff has been out. Everything's out now. Now if you try to take it back, you've got to put all this back together and put it back, right? So instead of trying to save face, I'm like, well, you know, I have another friend that's coming over to help me out with the drum set, so maybe I'll just have him take care of this first. And we're just hanging on to it. So now all of a sudden, my wife says, hey, you know, honey, I'm stinking. I really like my Tiffany's, but these were no good in the middle room. <laughs> Okay? I'm like, great! You know? So she's going to salvage them. But the point is, is that I learned something out of this. I have not invested in her. I have not invested in her. It wasn't about the lights. It wasn't about that at all. She wasn't even expecting it. It wasn't even a blip on the radar screen. I sent her a text the other day while she was still sleeping. Tell her how beautiful she looked. She came in and threw her arms around me. Now, did that cost me anything other than a second? It didn't cost me any money, did it? That was an investment. But if you're lukewarm, you just kind of, we're married. We're in a commitment together. We're good, we're good. We're running a church. Praise God. But we're not investing in any, in either one of us. When was the last time you invested in one another? When was the last time you invested in a friend or a relative or a co-worker? Or are you lukewarm? See, it doesn't just apply to God. It applies to our lives and how we, how we live it. Lukewarm doesn't get anywhere. It really doesn't. And I said on my Facebook post when I was talking about the sermon, I said, uh, when I was, I was in a missions trip, and I didn't want to put Jamaica because they'd be like, oh, really? That's not a missions trip. That's a vacation, you know? No, the outskirts of the vacation tourist area is very bad. And we slept on a floor with fire ants and in, a, in a school. It was not fun. And, you know, dogs, wild dogs barking, everything was not good. So um, I remember that it was so hot, but yet the water had no ice in it. It wasn't cold. And if you ever had, like, a, a, you know, a feeling where you're, like, you just want something cold just to kind of, like, you know, quench your thirst or sweating... It was warm water. It was like lukewarm water every time. And it just made me so sick. But I had to drink it or I'll pass out. And I'm thinking, that is exactly what brings it into this whole thing. Our lukewarmness is like that with God. He just said it. He's like, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Either you're totally against me or for me. But get all in or get all out. Don't ride the pine. So... The big question is, what is holding you back from being on fire for Jesus? And what do I mean? That doesn't mean I'm going to like get a match and light you up and let you scream and shout through the auditorium, okay? What it does mean is that in spirit, have you reignited your spiritual life? Have you woken up and, and just felt like a passion to worship God? Or are you so bogged down with the problems of life that you can just barely survive? Because if today was your last day on earth, how would you live it? How would you want it to go? Would you want to be praising God for what's about to come? Or would you even give him a second thought? Because you're so busy worrying about everything else in 24 hours, it's all going to disappear. That's a big question. I mean, this when I saw this again this morning, I went, oh boy, this is going to be another one of those crowd pleasers. But the truth is, guys, to be encouraging about it, as I finish up the slides, if we're honest about this, we as a church are going to grow. And I don't mean there's going to be more people, because that'll happen. I'm talking about we're going to grow spiritually and we're going to be stronger. And really, that's as a pastor, that's what you want. I'll take 50 strong people any day than 1,000 that have only maybe 10 that are strong. Because most of the other ones are there for the entertainment. I don't want people who are going to come in that truly are broken, messed up, busted, and say, I want to learn. I want to grow with God. 
I don't know what that entails. I have no idea. Perfect. You come to the right club. And then walk through that one day at a time. Through the laughter, through the tears, through the anger, through all the things in life that we go through. But at the end of the day, I believe our church is going to be a beacon that way. And I believe when people come in here and they feel that love and warmth, it's going to be genuine. And everybody's on a different playing field. Some people are up here, some people are down here. It depends on your walk. But today, you can start that walk in the right direction. It doesn't matter where you are. Okay? Three things to do to ignite your, your walk with God. Ask God to, number one, search your heart and reveal your true condition before him. That's huge. In your prayer life, you can ask that question. Search my heart, Lord. Search my heart. Stop pointing fingers at other people. They have to be fixed. Search my heart, Lord. Search me. What is it about me that needs to change? If I constantly point my finger at my wife, all I'm doing is, is, is neglecting myself. I'm, I'm actually deflecting, I should say. I'm just passing the buck along to her and vice versa. And if I'm saying, well, if she just changes, then the whole relationship will be better. Wrong methodology. How about what do I do? And she says the same thing, God will deal with her. And then as we're both being dealt with, that healing will come. But if we're busy pointing at each other, it's the blame game in the garden all over again. Adam and Eve. The devil made me do it. Well, you put this woman here. She fed me. They all knew what they were doing. And God didn't want to hear it. So, second one is give the grace. Give you, ask God to give you the grace to repent of any unconfessed sin and be more zealous and passionate for in your relationship with Him. Confession, I know people, if you've had a Catholic background, or for other people, you know, sometimes that word looks bad, confession. It's like, you know, the, the priest in the booth, and it's like, you know, hey, buddy, you know, bet on this horse, you know. And uh, the jokes, they just, they're just not happening today, you know. You come in, you play the horses anyway. So, um, you know, they go in and they talk to a priest, and, and, you know, the priest says certain things and says X amount of Hail Marys, and then you're forgiven, which that's not what the Bible says. But, the Bible does say, confess your sins to one another. Be careful who you confess them to. But to him first. But it is good to get him off your chest. And there's always going to be there. There's always going to be there. There's always going to be a new set. So we have to be able to confess that. We have to be actually be able to be honest and say, you know what? I realize my anger is out of control. My, you know, the way I treat my spouse or my boyfriend or whoever is out of control. The way I'm handling myself at work is out of control. Um, I've been abusive to people. I've had this and that. I've watched things I shouldn't have. I've touched people inappropriately. The list goes on. And so if we're willing to be honest with that and actually stay before God and say, okay, I'm repenting of. He knows it. And there's a liberation that goes on with that instead of hiding it. I hid many things for a long time. And when it finally came out, I'm still suffering the consequences of it at times. But I'll tell you something, I'm, I'm liberated. I don't need to hide it anymore. And God just continues to work one day at a time. Healing, healing, healing. I get, I get help every week from professionals. I know, I messed up. But, the good part is, is that I had to take the time to acknowledge that and say, God, I want to heal from the things that happened to me in my past. I want to heal from the things I dealt with or never dealt with when I was a kid. And all of a sudden, he's showing me things that I have had happened to me as a child that I'm like, I didn't realize that happened. I had no idea. I didn't think about it. That everything that happens to us in life, everything, it has a, a significant and profound effect on us when we're older. And that's why I tell people who are parents now, everything that you do with your child now is going to be replayed later. So what are you sowing into that kid? If you're yelling at them all the time, you're teaching them anger when they get older. If you're not telling them you love them, they're going to be cold-hearted when they get older. 
If you're constantly, you know, frustrating them, or the Bible says exasperating them, which means that they, they never feel like they can, they can actually express themselves, they won't do it. And when they get older and they're expected to do it with a spouse or, or other kids, they won't do it. And then they can't express it and then things fall apart. The list goes on. Last one says, help, help you open your heart, stay obedient, and intimately close to Jesus. Um, let me just say this. To wrap things up, some people have had a closed heart for years. And I mean years. And I'm going to tell you that if your heart is closed to them, if you have just locked it up and refused to share it because you're so hurt from things that happened to you from a long time ago, maybe it was a previous marriage, a previous relationship, whatever it may be, God's saying it's time to open it up now. But you have to have the courage to do it. And over and over again, the book of Joshua, as I'm reading in my study, he kept saying over and over again to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Have I not told you? Do not be discouraged. Do not fear. I am with you. Some of the best lines and best verses I've ever read in the Bible. The question is, will you open up your heart to him? And you may have come, and you may have even prayed a prayer with me, and you may have, even in your prayer life, have prayed. But have you really opened your heart up to him? And said, God, I'm all yours. I don't know the answer to that for you guys. And sometimes, I'm going to tell you, sometimes my heart is closed up because of things that happened to me in my life. Where I got so frustrated and so angry and different things like that. And just feeling like I'm all alone. And God keeps saying to me, you're going to close up on me? I know everything about you. All you got to do is open up to me. You don't need anybody else to do that to. Just me. I know that thing. I know this thing. Just open up. Maybe you've been cold-hearted for a long time and you played games to make sure that you put a, 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 a kind of a line between people where they never get that close because you don't want to be hurt. People are going to hurt you in life. It doesn't matter who they are. They could be me. I could say something one day and I even think about it and hurt you bad because I'm sinful. Somebody may say something and rub you the wrong way and they, they have no idea they hit, they hit a, a nerve. I've done that. I've said something to people, to a specifically, I think it was two people back in the old church, and I said, so matter of fact, and they ran out of the room. And it was nothing to me that was insulting. It was joking around. But something happened because a trigger went off. And when the trigger went off, when I said what they said, it brought them back to a point. I'm going to tell you this real quick. When I was younger, my father kind of like didn't have a lot of kind words to talk about education. And I was overweight. And then the things said, and they kind of carried with me. And one day we had something in our old church. It was called Are You Smart in the Fifth Grader, which was kind of a TV show. And Pastor Gary Clark, who was my, he was like my inter interim pastor over me at the time, said, why don't we do this you know, for the youth? And I'm like, yeah, great, you know, but I was hesitant. Now they're going to ask me Bible questions. Now here I am, an intern. I should be able to answer a lot of them, but I feel inferior. Because I knew from my time as, as younger, I was always told, you're not this, you can't do that. My mom tried, my stepfather tried to reverse that, but I just didn't want to listen. So of course they asked me a question, I didn't know it. The minute it happened, all these people were in front of me. Gary starts laughing his rear end off. I went home that night and cried like he would not believe. And he didn't even think anything of it. He didn't think it was a big deal. We were just joking around. But it triggered something in my past. And I had to ask God to search my heart and to release me of it. You see what I'm getting at with these guys? And so if I didn't do that, if I didn't work through that, and I still have issues with it at times, 
And he's saying, you don't have to, your, your value is not how so-called smart you think you are. Your value is how do you worship me? How do you serve me? And I will elevate you. And from that point on, it has changed my perspective in my life. I did go to college. I went to Gloucester County College and I got an associate's in marketing management. That's as far as I took it. But that didn't make or break me. But what I'm doing here today, that had nothing to do with it. I'm here today because God broke my heart in a good way. And said, now we're going to rebuild you. I want you all to understand something. I know the mood is quiet here, and that's okay. But I want you to understand something. To really have the courage to say these things that we're talking about up here with God, you're going to have to reopen some things. And if you reopen some things, it's going to hurt. But as that pain comes to the surface, it starts to make its way out and you start to release it. There's a saying my good friend John Gaines said, he copied it from another pastor. <laughs> it says that you have to have the courage to trace the problem. Allow the Holy Spirit to trace the problem. To actually face it and admit that, that it is a problem. And then, what was the other one? Erase it, which means you need to take Jesus by the hand and ask him to take you through those healing waters and then replace it with God's word and what he says about it. And that formula is amazing, but it's tough. And if you really, really want to grow with God, you're going to have to have the courage to open up and ask him to do that. Then you won't be lukewarm anymore. You'll be so hot you can't stand it. And it'll be warm. But it's certainly better than being lukewarm. There'll be many people that'll come long after we fill these seats and you guys will continue to come. And then as we start adding back rows, there's more people coming in. And what happens? You're going to encounter people who don't even know a thing about God, or maybe you're going to have some people that have been to other churches and they're lukewarm. You're going to be able to spot it right away. And all you do is love on them and direct them to the truth. You continue to do that and pray for them and let God handle their heart. Watch, wait, and see what happens in this church. I don't care if we fill out this, this 250 capability here to the capacity. If we have a bunch of lukewarm Christians, this thing isn't going anywhere. And I can't control that. All I can do is teach and be the messenger. So the question is, do you know them? You may not even be lukewarm. You're on the cold side because you don't even know who he is. And God doesn't want us to go through life just wondering who he is. So we talk about the ABCs. A, you've got to make the truth about yourself that your sin separates you from the Holy God. It's the world we live in. It's because of the fall of man we are born into a sinful, fallen world. There's unfairness here. There's injustice here. There's messed up stuff here because of disobedience from Adam and Eve in the garden. And we inherited it. And until he's ready to come back, it's still going to be here. But he did something about the problem by giving us his son Jesus Christ to die for our sins. To die on the cross to pay for our sins, past, present, and future. And that C is we commit our lives to him. After we repent and admit, and then we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we then C, commit our lives to saying, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. The things that you want me to do is what I'm striving for. And we kind of slide the beam there and says, do it today, because you never know your last breath. And I'm, I'm here to tell you guys, I know this was a little bit on the, you know, it was a little tough. But I'm going to tell you that every time that I get up here and preach, don't you dare think that I'm absolved with this. It doesn't apply to me. Nine times out of ten, it applies to me first. <laughs> And then I get to preach it. So first the conviction of doing the sermon, then the conviction of preaching it during the sermon, 
And then the conviction of afterward, are you going to continue it? Welcome to my world. Okay? But that's what I'm here for. And I want you guys, all of us together as a team, to walk through this thing called life together. Don't feel that you're alone. Don't feel that God has abandoned you. But he's asking for your heart. Will you give it to him? That's a big question. So I want to thank you. I know we're going to roll over time here, but my goodness, communion. Uh, let's pass it out there, Chief. I know, she's falling asleep on me. Everybody's falling asleep on me. It's okay. This evening's radio show is sponsored by. Yep. We're going, to do, we're going to do communion here, guys. You just take a wafer and a, and a juice as it comes through. Yeah. Keep it short. It's not about a ritual. This is actually what Jesus commanded us to do, which is remember him. Remember him of what he did. And when we look at this, this wafer is actually supposed to represent the bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And what we do is we, we remember that he died for us, that he sacrificed his, his life so we may live. And the juice, that this actually represents the wine that they had at night. And it talks about how that is a representation of the blood that was spilled out of his body, which is the purification of our sins. Sounds crazy, right? But really what it is, is the representation of what he did for us to never, ever forget. That it's not about us, it's not him. And if you need more detail about it, I can fill you in after the service is over. But what we're going to do at a moment here is take this together. But I, I, I really want to, to just um, without Jesus there is no hope. Without him knowing what he did we are left in our own mess. Without him coming to this earth and being lower than love and show us true humility, we have no real periscope. And so with him, what he did, it's not about us, it's what he did for us. Christianity is the only religion that says that the king, the creator, came down to us and died for us, not the other way around. And so as we, we lift this together, I want you to think and open up your heart and thank God that we don't have to worry about where we're going after this life is over. And we don't have to worry about the mess that we're leaving right now. Because you know what? He is the ultimate cleaner. And all he's asking for is our hearts. So as we take the bread and we lift it up together, let us take and remembrance and eat. And his juice. It represents, it should be the wine. It represents the blood. Without his blood being spilled, there is no forgiveness of sin. And before he came onto the scene, there was an animal that had to die for the sins of the people. And now he is the perfect lamb that sacrificed for us. So let's lift the cup and let us toast to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and let's take and drink. Father, how grateful we are. Lord, how, how amazingly grateful we are for you saving us. Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, 
And I just pray, Lord, that you hear their prayer, that you pray along. A prayer for something like this. Father, for in heaven, forgive me for our sin. But I admit, Lord, that I am a sinner, but that I need you. I need you to believe in your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I commit my life to you today. And God, for those who know you, Lord, I just pray that edification comes. That, Lord, your, your spirit is ministering to people here right now. I pray, Lord, that those who couldn't come today will hear this message and will be convicted as well. And it is for all of us. And so, Lord, as we go on to our social time and spend time with one another, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you be on our hearts. Heal us, Lord. We open up our hearts to you. Do what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, over here, we're going to have a couple of people, uh, those prayer warriors are going to pray uh, for you if you'd like to come over here for prayer. And we're going to ask that social time will be through those double doors. So you guys want to talk, hang out, and there's going to be some snacks back there. Check it out, okay? Thank you. Love you all. Amen. Love you too. Love you too.